Hi, um, hello everyone. Greetings from Ashoda Hospitals. Um, today uh, we have um, a topic on robotic bronchoscopy. Um, Dr. A. B. L. Reyes um, is our invited faculty today and he will be taking us through the journey of robotic bronchoscopy and uh, this is um, we planned it in a way like uh, for the beginners because most of the Asian countries still don't have the um, technology yet so we thought we make a series of uh, uh, webinars or online educational events where you can learn um, from inside the OR Dr. A.B. can show us like how um, the bronchoscopy happens and how do you plan a case of robotic bronchoscopy so uh, we have uh, our invited guest speaker, Dr. Abir Alreis, uh, welcome. And um, to uh, have more details on him, he is currently the medical director at the Intervention Pulmonary Unit at uh, Aurora Medical Center, USA. And uh, he's also associated uh, with us as an associate professor at Roseland Franklin University of Medicine. A uh, lot of um, training at uh, Cleveland uh, Medical Center when he was a IP fellow there and uh, we uh, used to watch a lot of videos on YouTube um, on uh, Ebus cook needle uh, biopsies uh, we, uh, we saw a lot from him and also he's got a lot of uh, awards uh, he got um, AABIP uh, leadership award service leadership award in 2018 and also he got an award for his uh, presentation at the World Congress of Bronchology and Intervention Pulmonology a lot of publications especially in intervention pulmonology and also he is an online teacher we do follow his uh, youtube channel where he recently started teaching robotic bronchoscopy online so he is using uh, ion by institute and then he will be taking us through this journey we have um, panelists like uh, Dr. Jamalul Azizi, he's joining us from uh, Malaysia. Dr. Ronald Hilby from Philippines and uh, Dr. Eric Daniel Tender from uh, Indonesia. Dr. Tinku Kedar and Vishweshran from uh, India. So we thought we will uh, do it as an interactive session and then uh, so many doubts we have regarding cone beam CT and also robotic bronchoscopy. So uh, feel free to ask any questions at the end of the lecture and uh, over to you uh, Dr. Avi. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be with you guys because this is what I was looking for for a long time. And uh, uh, really, I'm happy that uh, I can share some of the uh, experience that uh, we work uh, at the, with the, with the uh, uh, robotic bronchoscopy. Uh, I would like to start with uh, uh, just talking about, as you mentioned, we are focusing today on uh, basics of robotic bronchoscopy only, because uh, I think it's a good idea, as Harry mentioned, that we should not jump to the uh, techniques or the uh, advanced uh, uh, options that you have compared with bronchoscopy right away, at least to know how things work. And I have disclosures, as uh, I mentioned, I work with CHEST and ABIP as a board director member, and I am in consulting service with Intuitive, but for educational purposes. So the objectives today, I will start with a simple question. Why do we need robotic bronchoscopy if we have bronchoscopy? Then I will take you through a journey with one day of a person who is going under uh, for uh, robotic bronchoscopy. We'll start from planning to the day of the procedure, how we set up that uh, robot before, what anesthesia is recommended for it how we can uh, implement the things together differently before we can put the scope in right away in the AT tube. Here we have to have some settings that we will share. And then we'll talk about like any navigation bronchoscopy about registration and then driving to the target, how we drive. And then we'll see how different it is from bronchoscopy, collecting samples. And at the end, if needed, we place fiducial uh, uh, placement. So we start with why do we need robotic bronchoscopy? As we know, uh, when we do any bronchoscopy, we have three motions that affecting our sampling. Rotation, uh, up and down by the thumb, and also in and out by the movement of the scope. And with that, if we are targeting a lesion that it is less than two centimeters, we will experience that. So the rotation can take us around that lesion. 
instead of taking it uh, on the spot. And maybe you are really fixated in that area, but the target is there and the motion of the breathing will be in your way that the little rotation of the scope can take you off target. The second thing is our, uh, we are human and we can get fatigued after second case, third case of the day. And with the shoulder getting fatigued, you can also move in and out and that can affect the, uh, uh, how, how far you are in the airways because moving in and out can take you off one bronchus and put you in another one that branching next to it and causing a missed target again. The last one is very easily, and this is, I found it the most affecting uh, for any person, which is controlling the thumb in directly in this place where you can keep that uh, working, extending working channel in the spot, or even the takeoff of the working channel from the scope, uh, that both affected by that uh, thumb. Uh, so with those three errors, which is a human errors most of the time, the robot, I think, it took over in a point that took all those errors and minimized them to the lower, lower level. Because you are minimizing the human error here, but you are not eliminating the, pressure, uh, the patient uh, ventilation variation. So as you see that the difference now, you are not holding the scope. You are really driving a catheter to that level that where the nodule is. And you stop there and nothing will move it except if there is a major movement of the whole system out or the patient is not paralyzed. And with that, that will lead us for advantage. And the advantage is when I have more stability and I have a breach with that uh, catheter for farther for the third, fourth and fifth bifurcation of any bronchus or a lobe, that will give me the option to challenge myself to go for smaller nodules. And this is a learning curve for any user, for any platform. I'm not just advocating for uh, one system versus another, but you'll see that when you start doing your five to 10 to 20 to 30 cases, your level of understanding and feeling where is that catheter is will improve and your yield will start going down to lower size of nodules. And this is what you see mainly uh, that the numbers now, we are targeting 10 millimeters and below that before usually we order a CAT scan to follow up in three months to see how this lung nodule behaving. So now let's start the journey and we go through a day through robotic bronchoscopy. So now we have a patient that presented, she has a history of lung uh, endometrial cancer with a CAT scan that shows seven millimeter lung nodule in the left upper loop. So first thing, we need to know what is the settings of that CAT scan that can, we can use and how soon I need to order the CAT scan from the procedure. So any, any CAT scan that the patient has with one centimeter cuts or less uh, thickness, or if you find that it is 380 to 450 cuts, that should be compatible to plan a good airway uh, uh, tree when you do the planning. When I say the planning is going through the ion computer prior to the procedure to put the target like any other navigation system. The other thing is uh, the timing should be within a month. That recommended because you don't want to do a procedure on a patient that it might be either increasing or decreasing in size. The second thing, <clears throat> the one month cut off, is that an error from the machine that will remind you. It's as a reminder for you to make sure that you know that this CAT scan has been more than a month. But that will not stop you from using it if you know that this is not changing and the patient is just uh, show up late for you after the CAT scan done. Most importantly, as long as they can create it, that platform that has one centimeter or less cut, that should be enough. So this is how we, we start. We load the CAT scan in the system. When the CAT scan generated, you will see on the uh, side, side here, the bronchial tree generated. And now you are ready to start the planning. As you see here, our target is the seven millimeter nodule on the left upper lobe. Uh, and I will draw, we'll see how uh, the airway looks like. Uh, this is how the map generated. You have the option of rotation and for zooming in and out to see where your target is. 
when you see a bronchial tree having that much uh, uh, bifurcation, that should be a good target for you. As any other platform, uh, we will be happier if we see an air bronchial uh, uh, sign going toward uh, bron airway bronchial side going toward <coughs> the lesion. In this case, we generated another airway, <coughs> excuse me, to find that nodule. Now, in this one, we will see how when we created the airway, uh, then we will start uh, building the target. When we add the target now, you'll notice that we find the tab, add target tab, you press on it. And then when you find the target, you will press on the target and that the, the, the platform gonna generate and suggest for you, this is the target that we think that it is you should go after. By pressing on it, the air immediately it identify that target. Although you might think that the, the nodule is bigger than what it is already assigned. And you have the option manually, as you see, with a plus sign there to increase the size of the nodule. It gives you an advantage, especially if there is a neighboring airway that passing by that uh, nodule that was not included, as you see lower here, make it bigger, maybe that will include that on the target. And now the next step is to add a path. Because the moment that you see the target, we're happy about the size, about the location, then you move to the next step, which is generating a pathway. So you add a path after you have a target, as you see, the target was eight by seven millimeter. When you press create a path, two things formed. The path that suggested by the uh, platform, how to drive there. The second thing, as you see, there is anatomy border for the next nearest pleura. And that tells you how far are you from the pleura also to protect any pneumothorax from happening which is very helpful when you go through the, the procedure. Now, also what you see there in numbers of the nearest target to the exit point, the exit point from this to the target, that far part from the exit point and the angle. What is the angle between my exit point from the airway to the target? And in this case, as you see, it's 33%. Anything less than 45% should be acceptable because you have that maneuver that you can do with the catheter to adjust when you reach that, that distal part of the airway. Now, after generating the pathway, you can review the, 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 the path. By reviewing the path, that will give you two things. As you see, you have the virtual map, you have that bronchial tree, and you have also guidance to tell you where are you in the bifurcations between the airways. And here you can see to the left upper, left upper anterior, and then farther there to the lesion. You have the option to move that crosser manually, so you can build the muscle memory in case something went wrong with the robot. At least you have a backup if you can use another uh, platform, bronchoscopy to go there. The other thing is, as you see here, it gives you the map, the target, how we can know the bifurcation one by one. And when you are done with that, then, and you're happy about it, you can export. If you are not happy with the preview, you go back and you adjust, or you add another target, or you add another pathway. The option here, you can see that you can rotate in 3D. You know where your projection, how your airway put continuing. You see the 33 degrees between the exit point and the nodule. And as you see here, it is seven, still seven to eight millimeter long nodule, but it is having an adjusting near uh, uh, um, airway that make us think that we can reach it. So this buildup of the case, before even the patient even seen, sometimes if we know about the, the CAT scan, because that helped to know, set up the plan before we go for, to meet the patient. So now we accepted the plan, patient accepted the procedure. 
and we're moving to the day of the procedure. What, how we can set up the OR and what is the, how, how you can activate the system with the specific things that you should do uh, for that uh, point. So first part is you have two things. You have the controlling plan, plan here where you, can, you are working and you have also the screen with the arm of the robot. So if you see, the instruction will be given to you by the robot what to do step by step. But always you start by activating it. Moving the arm is by holding a controller and moving it, it, it go, and goes, go in three different um, angles, as you see, to adjust to the way that you want the airway to be next to the uh, robot. After you do that, it will tell you start calibration and start also moving right and left, up and down, just to have safety that the arm is working well, no damage done to it before, before the case. You see those all done calibration by the machine itself, but it's important to complete so you know that it's ready and there's no malfunction should be happening during the procedure. The next step is you connecting three parts. There is a the catheter expansion or uh, the, the arm that help pushing the catheter in. The second part, the catheter itself. And the third part, the vision probe that goes inside the catheter. And we'll go over each one of them. So the first part is, as I told you, that the catheter connector that connect the catheter and lead it with that accordion movement for how you advance the catheter in and out. And this usually connect and has specific lives, uh, uh, five to seven lives. Uh, so you can put it there and move on to tell you even every step, the machine, where to put it. And when connected, it will give you a sound and okay that with the blinking of the light that the catheter, that the piece is already connected. The second thing to avoid any uh, connection, uh, problems with, with the dirt or dust, we clean the connecting part between the arm and the catheter. And the cleaning happened by using specific device that provided with the robot. So this is where the chips goes from the, uh, the catheter. So by putting it there and making multiple uh, pushes, that five to seven pushes that help uh, cleaning up that part. And now, uh, you move to the next step, which is connecting the catheter, which is the catheter that has the navigation ability to drive through the airway. The catheter, as you see, connect with uh, another piece and extend it down. That the connector that goes on the machine and the catheter ending down there. And as you see, the size of that is 3.5 millimeter. So when you compare that catheter with different other uh, platforms, for example, the, the Olympus uh, um, uh, Therapeutic Bronx BF1, you, the, the diameter, outer diameter is 6.2 millimeter and the working channel is 2.8 millimeter. The other robot Monarch has also two catheters, the main catheter that six millimeter and then extended catheter that goes out with outer diameter 4.4 and the working channel of that 2.1 millimeter. And that one can give you a continuous vision during the, uh, the procedure. On the other hand, the ion has a 3.5 millimeter outer diameter and working channel of 2.0. And those, the difference between the platforms that you have and we used to use, uh, then, the second part, we are doing cleaning the catheter itself now with the same concept that we did to, for that same connector to prevent any error from any dust or any kind of uh, dirt that filled that area and to have very clear connection between the catheter and the arm of the robot. When all of these steps completed, now it's the time to connect the catheter that goes through that channel and that extended arm uh, that will help us move in and out with the robot. When you hit that area, 
you have to make sure that you support from down and you click and you get that signal that you, you're connected at the same time. When that step completed, the catheter will start calibration. And you see that by having the catheter doing almost 360 uh, movement in and out, back and forth. And that's how you know the, the clearance from the robot about using this catheter prior to the procedure is also completed. So right, left, up and down with that 380 uh, turns all over to make sure that we will not face any angle difficulty during the procedure. There's this very important piece that we always use during the procedure, although it is just a plastic bag, but it's important because between the devices, changes device, especially the vision probe, as you see later, it's important to put it in a place that hanging next to you if you need to switch back and forth. And this is even a reminder from the, uh, the machine to tell you you have to put it because you don't want the number one exposed those pieces that going inside the patient to more uh, any contamination. At the same time, also to have everything in place. Now we are connecting the vision probe, which is the part that goes inside the catheter. As you see, the vision probe has a, a connector. Uh, it's, it's a catheter that has light at the end. You fit it inside that cath the, the, the working channel catheter. And then when you start going in, you'll see on the screen now, green and blue lights, uh, right and left. Very important to drive slowly to get the signal for better vision calibration of the colors. And this is a step you should not be rushed. It takes like 10 seconds to push the catheter the whole way in, but it's very important to follow instructions on the screen while you're doing that to prevent any mismatch or vision and color mismatch when you finish. When you get that in the end, you get a, a okay signal also from the robot telling you it's ready to be function now. So now we'll move to the second step, which is very important point when we do any, any navigation bronchoscopy, not only robots, because when we are that, aiming to go after any lung nodule that is located in a place that farther in the lung, when we talk about even left, uh, left lower and left uh, right lower lobes, atelectasis is very high chance to happen. And there is a great paper from Michael Pritchett and Badra <clears throat> about what anesthesia consideration we should use when you use any navigation bronchoscopy going after a lung nodule. And this is a very great graph uh, 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 from, from their paper, shows the difference before we knew about using and implementing anesthesia setups for those procedures before and after we learned it. In the upper three, uh, uh, images, you can see how after induction and in the procedure, the left lower, especially the posterior part of the lungs develop easily atelectasis. And, and when this form, you number one, you lost your planning because you planned on a CAT scan with fully expanded lungs. And now if the lesion even sitting in the anterior part of the lungs, you are not doing it in the right spot. There will be diversion between the lung nodule where it was and the, uh, the, the, uh, the target that you are going after at this point with this CAT scan. The second part is even if it's that, even if it's in the anterior part, but if it's in the posterior part, you, you lost very ad any advantage of finding it too, because now everything consolidation, everything will look like a nodule or even a mass now. And then you put the patient for a procedure that not fair that went under with all this preparation. So the recommendation, as you know, just I'm facing some difficulty here, moving on. Here you go. So multiple steps, very important. I will emphasize on at least three to four of them. <laughs> Starting with recruitment, asking the patient to take deep breath using incentive spirometer in the PACU before going to the procedure, that's a good idea. Also pre-oxygenation is uh, good, but should not be with 100% uh, FiO2 if possible to avoid any absorption atelectasis. <clears throat> of course, we want the patient always to be 
completely paralyzed for the procedure under TIVA. Avoid inhalational agents because that can cause also and help causing absorption at telectasis. Intubation should be as soon as possible and prevent too prolonged period of time between the induction and the intubation. And using larger tube size in ladies more than eight millimeter internal diameter and in, in uh, males more than 8.5. If possible, that will be uh, ideal to prevent atelectasis and help also with uh, um, ventilation and using the equipment. After intubation, if we suspect that there was a lot of intubation delay during the induction, we do for recruitment maneuvers by using 40 and 40 uh, with high PEEP. Uh, that's explained very well in the paper. I don't wanna uh, go over it too many times there, but more importantly, to maintain a PEEP during the procedure that it is 10 to, uh, to 12, and the worst thing to be at least eight, but nothing like five, because that will build up your atelectasis and prevent you from continuing the work. Of course, continue all the time with paralytic agent and use uh, the PEEP. If we are doing any breath hold, always consider the APO valve to be at the same level of the PEEP when you're holding the breath. We are not going over that maneuver today because we're not talking about uh, cone beam uh, spins, and but that's important maneuver, hold breath when you use cone beam and spin to know exactly where your needle is when you are doing the cone beam. So to take home message, at least remember, make sure that you are, your FiO2 is uh, uh, about uh, like 40% to 60% maximum. Second thing is uh, tidal volume wise, if we go to the eight to 10 millimeter per kg, ml per kg, that would be better. Although uh, that would give us more expansion. Always I ask the anesthesiologist to keep eyes on the vitals because some patients have very low with the being MPO um, might be dehydrated and that shift of the intrathoracic pressure can cause some kind of uh, uh, hypotension. But with that, I prefer them to use uh, the PEEP over the tidal volume. Always keep your eye on the anesthesia machine because you don't want to see 100% FiO2, PEEP of five and low tidal volume. Those are three things at least during the procedure to keep an eye with the anesthesiologist. And always the best thing, the communication with anesthesia staff is the key. Now we are starting the procedure, patient is anesthetized with all the protocol that we spoke about. And now we are in a, the, the machine as we prepare it, everything ready. And we're moving to the next step is connecting the machine to the arm to the to the patient. As you see on this video, that there is a specific connecting device that has two metal ends. This is the same what we use for bronchoscopy. That will have a magnet effect to connect to the arm. And very important to make sure always that both parts as uh, sealed with the two parts on the arm there to get a stability during the procedure. Because the last thing you want after starting the procedure is that this piece disconnected because your plan of registration where you are target is will start over. So this is uh, why I put the video for it. Very important point. Of course, you see that click happened. Then you make sure that you pull back you don't want the arm to be fully extended. That's why we, went, we make it in a V shape as much as we can. And we follow the instructions now. After, uh, if we are happy about the connection, we see there's no tension between the ET tube and the connecting part from the, uh, the arm. At that point, we move to the next step, which is the connecting now the, and inserting the catheter into the, the AT tube. Very important step, make sure that this catheter is looped. Although, as you know, it's 3.5, and we know now 3.5 millimeter, the AT tube is 8.5 millimeter. It's very important that it's looped, especially when we target something in the left or right upper lobes, that the lube is not only for the AT tube passage, is also for the airways, because we are going after the fifth or fourth bifurcation. When the catheter is in, you connect now the accordion uh, extension 
do that arm. And now this is what will play a role on in and out movement. And the other movement, 360, will be by rotating the ball on the, on the cursor. Now we're moving to next step. We are everything connected to the patient, everything ready there. This is a reminder about our target. It is the left upper lobe lung nodule that it was seven to eight millimeter in diameter. So how I'll show you just a quick video before we started the, the procedure, how things connected. And this is not, the, not something ideal, but always you have to think how to optimize using <clears throat> the maximum space in your endoscopy and OR or any uh, IP suite to the maximum benefit of safety number one of the, uh, of the robot, because you don't want, uh, as you see here, we have the backup bronchoscopy. Then we have the robot there standing there, and then the, uh, the arm and the C arm. I would like to emphasize on one point here. As you see, we try to angle that catheter that going inside the, the ET tube to angle that make it more smoother to go in, in more less than 90 degrees angle as much as you can. The second thing that will give you advantage is a space between your fluoro and your robot. Because any motion or disconnection of the piece here we spoke about earlier will cancel your registration. So always make sure that you have all your setup prior to the start. And I will tell you, this has really become a learning curve for all of us, not only the operator, but also the staff, the anesthesia, everyone knows where things will go. And the more you do the procedure, that you can think that those all steps will take long time, but those happen simultaneously when the patient was seen in the pack, you, the other person setting up the machine, and then everything is ready when the patient comes in, angle to the patient, to the anesthesia, they intubate the patient when it's ready, we go in and we start the, the case. As you see, the C arm is sitting here also in, a, uh, in an angle that can be give us a, sw a swing if we need to. And now we are moving to the registration. Uh, I'm moving now from the room to the what you see as operator. This is every case you, that you do, you can record the case from beginning to the end. And this is the view you will get. You'll get the virtual view, the actual live view. And then when you do registration, you'll get your platform and guidance for the bronchial tree up in this screen. So I'll start now the, the registration. First thing, before you start the registration, make sure that the distance matching between your um, uh, main carina on the virtual and on the uh, uh, actual view. The second thing what recommended is to see at least uh, the ET tube is not close by there or, or four rings of the trachea will be enough for the, where the ET tube outlet before you see the carina. Very important point that make, make it give the catheter more options to move right or left without restriction because of the ET tube. I skipped um, the, the whole um, like three lobes registration, but I'm giving you an idea what you should look for when you are registering. So the plan, as the, the best uh, goal is to see if you can go to each lobe as far from the other lobe. For example, you here, you can see that you get to the right upper lobe. When you get to the right upper lobe, you get a signal from the machine that registration uh, uh, done for that part. Then you drive to the right lower lobe. When you hit the point that the machine knows that this right lower lobe also give you a signal and then you go farther to the left lower lobe. Avoid always middle lobe and lingula because those mis, uh, give the machine um, a misconception where's the left upper and lower and same thing to the right. The second thing, choose the farthest lower lobes segments that you can. The farther the two points between the registration between the upper lobes and the lower lobes will give you better bifurcation and connection between the data. 
And here you will see, for example, the last lobe. When you enter the left upper lobe, you start having the, the, the machine recognize that you're on the left upper lobe. You drive inside there. The more you move farther, the moment that you, the, the machine will recognize that it is completed, you get a four okays, and now the platform formed that matching your uh, planning. The most important step after that is that the airway matching. We should not start the procedure before we make sure that our planned airway matching our uh, 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 real time airway. And you'll see it more easy when we look at this video. So after we got the whole 3D map here with the anatomical border, with the planned uh, pathway, the caster where it is located, now we don't pull back right away to the main crime. We take our time to see if the airways, especially distal airways, are matching when we look at both uh, both pa parts. For example, here you can see you can see that you can see here two airways bifurcation, and you can see two here. Although it's mismatching by the angle, but still you can recognize that it match by the bifurcation. You pull back a little bit, and now you see the same bifurcation, the real time bifurcation matching. And if I back up a little bit, you start seeing now another takeoff, which is the lingula with the left upper. And you back up more. And now you see the left upper takeoff with the left lower and also matching both of them here. And then when you reach the left main stem at that time, you know that it is easier to match larger airway by concept. The larger airway will be easier to match than the smaller airway. And that's why when you are farther in the airway and you are in the fourth bifurcation, you should not move back as soon as possible before you make sure that you are matching those small segments. And that will give you better registration and then easier drive to that pathway. So this step is very vital when you are planning the case and when you are registering. When you hit the point that you are back to the main carina, at that time, you will have the option that we, we saw that diversion in the airway angle rotation earlier. That can be easily fixed by having on the crosser that you have the option to rotate the uh, navigation uh, part uh, as you see now, it's easy to, to rotate that in little 20 degrees, and now both of them matching. Now, we have our registration, the patient paralyzed. We, are, we know that our registration, we're happy about it with the uh, map that we see. We now have the time to drive to the target. Also here, I skipped most of the target driving because I want you to get to the point that we are leading to the plan as we planned earlier. The exit point here, we are reaching those type of bifurcation far in the lung where the airways become more collapsible, especially with if there's atelectasis formed. Patients with overweight also become more difficult to maintain those tiny airways open. So multiple maneuvers can be used by uh, just an injection of air to open that uh, airways can be used. And as you see here, you, we drive until we reach that bifurcation and your goal is to get to the airway that is more toward the legion. And when you get to that airway, you'll see your legion on the path. But as you see here, our exit point is far away from where we planned exit point. So I know now I am on the airway, desirable airway that I want but I need to make some adjustments to get the, the path, the, 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 um, the uh, target on the same angle, or at least on the 30 degree angle as we planned it. And here now we can see in this video that adjustment of the rotation of the target, uh, of, the, of the catheter, I start seeing the target in front of me. And 
that's not seeing the, tar the target itself. Maybe I'm tended here against an airway, which is better in that case, because I want to have my radial EVOS or my needle to penetrate, to get to the lesion, rather than drive through an airway that's there and miss the target. So always it's important to see this sign that you are facing a, uh, a more uh, a wall or a lesion itself, maybe sometimes, uh, rather than you see a patent airway. Because if you introduce now the radial over that, it will go through that easy path for your least resistance and you miss seeing your lesion. And now we know that we are there, but I want a confirmation. So the confirmation can be done either by using as the, the cone beam, which is the, uh, the, the best, but also having cone beam for every case is not always the, the solution. Um, you don't want to expose too much radiation to yourself, the staff, or the patient. The second thing, if something can be getting with the radial EVOS, also the budget-wise, it's better to use things that with less um, budget to make sure that you do more cases than you are restricted with one technology. In this case, we use radial EVOS with fluoro. And here we go, that the steps that you do as you know, we explained earlier, we have the vision probe inside the, the catheter. So what we need to know now, this is not a continuous vision uh, robot. So you have to take the vision probe out and now insert the using the working channel by placing the radial EVOS. The same step that you use radial with uh, 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 the, the uh, bronchoscopy or with any any another navigation uh, system. The only advantage here, as you see, my hands are free. All what I'm controlling is putting the radial in and out, angling it, changing the angle until I get the good picture. Different from when you are holding the scope and trying to maintain it at the same time, putting your eye where I should put that uh, the, the radial, and then when you get it in, you might have some error with the movement that we explained earlier. Now, moving back to the, the patient and the screen that you're looking at, this is you are with me in the case now, looking at the screen, I'm advancing the radial within the floral, and I start seeing some at the exit point of that a lesion here on the radial that even matching the size and the and as we planned earlier and the shape. That gave me more confidence that I am either um, eccentric from it, but although I am very close there, uh, for that reason, we decide to move with the uh, uh, next step, which is the tBNA. I will show first um, tBNA that uh, uh, compatible uh, by by uh, with with the robot, it's exactly the same principle needle that you use with EVOS. It has extended uh, it has the catheter adjustment to make sure that you are out of the catheter before you uh, uh, put the uh, needle out. It has the depth one to five centimeters, the same thing what you have on the on the EVOS needle, and it has a lock to to decide how far the needle can go in. And it comes in 21 gauge, 25 gauge, uh, and 23 gauge uh, uh, needles. So the same thing, the stylus is there that you remove and you apply suction. So I'll show you here the steps of putting it in, the same idea, it locks. And then if the cat is already uh, adjusted to be out of the needle, is already there, you decide your depth. And then under fluoro, you insert the needle. When you see the needle uh, uh, in, you can take the stylus out. After taking the stylus out, you apply suction, desirably minus five to minus 10, depends how much your sample is, you see it bloody or not on the slide. When you apply the, uh, the uh, stabs, you will see that now, here, you go, you can see the TBNA, the needle coming out. The good thing that if you look here, it show you 
if there's a force forming. And this is you are doing multiple passes or multiple stabs on the uh, needle, uh, even show you how much force you are generating in that area. Using rows during the procedure is awesome. And this is the sample from the same patient uh, on, on from the tBNA that confirm showing highly suspicious uh, adeno type of carcinoma. When we know that, usually we move to the next step, which is doing a uh, 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 biopsies, because uh, always we found that if we get biopsies from there, we get better results uh, with, uh, with the amount of tissue, especially for genomic testing. And you see sometimes in this case also, we got even a piece of like a full of flesh is not a clot, not a, a lesion that uh, it looks a part of a lesion or even a lung tissue. But uh, we see it a lot with this technology now because we are really precise and we are locked on that target. Uh, after that, giving the idea that this patient is like having multiple comorbidities and also has a history of um, adenomaterial cancer. Uh, I, we didn't know uh, how much surgically uh, can be candidate for removal of the nodule. And also given the location of the nodule, it's so far, uh, it's so close to the central, so it might cost her a lobe to treat that uh, nodule. So usually with those small lung nodule, we place a fiducial. And Again, you are locked on the target. You can reinforce by checking another radial, and we confirm that. We push the radial in, uh, sorry, push the uh, fiducial in, and then uh, you can see now the fiducial sitting on the lesion, and now we start withdrawing our catheter out. This is the journey of this patient that day. And uh, I would like to see if, if we'll have more time for questions, of course, but I will leave you with few um, summary about this uh, technology in general. So does it help us? Yes, especially with the stability, with giving us the option to go after smaller size uh, nodules, especially with the outreach that you can reach with that catheter small size. Also, now we are more confident to target smaller lung nodules that will help us having early detection of malignancy. That technology also easier to be compatible with other diagnostic tools. Radial EVOS, you see how much it is more fluent to be used. You can adjust a small millimeter, less than millimeter movement up, down, right, left, or advance or back up a little bit. And you stay in that area until you find that lesion. Cone beam also, it's compatible because you don't want somebody to hold the scope. You know that when you need to spin, everybody needs to leave the, the room. And with the, uh, before we, with the cone beam, with the bronchoscopy, you have to have an arm holding the scope in the spot before you get out to do uh, the spin. This is not needed. The catheter is landing there with any robot system and cone beam can be uh, spin there without any options. That will open the door for us also in the future for those patients they are not candidate for surgery to have localized endobronchial uh, treatments. And you know about all those microwave um, treatments that already established and going on. I can see that in the couple few years we start doing that in the bronchoscopy world uh, rather than sending them for SPOT or for surgery. With that, I hope this will be giving us a shift from seeing those patients that have advanced cancer, metastatic cancer, or even airway obstructions to be more stage one and two. And down the road in five to 10 years, I hope the survival um, of those patients change from being very short in five years to be more because we start detecting those patients in earlier stage. This is all the work done is not because of me. 
because of the team that I work with. And I, without them, I would not be able to do any of that as it's a combined work. It needs a lot of collaboration and, and, and we're learning a lot from it and our experience, not myself only, everyone in this picture improving by using it. And I would like also to remind you as uh, Harry mentioned in the beginning about uh, the robotic bronchoscopy uh, YouTube channel. It will be uh, actively putting on especially special techniques, advantages of using it, multiple videos there. It will be continue for education of specific functions on robotic bronchoscopy that maybe in the future we'll make another talk about those difficult cases that we will do in advanced rather than basic robotic bronchoscopy talk. Feel free to scan uh, this uh, code right away to the uh, YouTube channel to subscribe. And with that, I would like to thank everybody for the time and for the invitation. And I'm so happy to be part of this group. And uh, we can move to the, I'll stop sharing now and move to the questions. Thank you so much, A.B., for uh, that elusive presentation. We have heard a lot of uh, lectures on robotic bronchoscopy, mostly on the theoretical aspects and the studies. But I think it is very useful for beginners like us to see directly in the work. Like, uh, let me start. Like, we have uh, panelists from India, Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia. So I have a few questions for you. Like, uh, what will be the procedural time on an average and what is the number of cases that a physician or, or an IP guy should perform to attain, attain procedural competency with robotic bronchoscopy? And uh, how many nurses are required in the OR when you do this procedure? Like, uh, um, just elaborate on this. Okay, uh, so let's start with the first question. Uh, it's a learning curve. Uh, actually, you will start always using the targeting a larger legions make it uh, easier for you. But the average time between the time with the catheter in to the lesion can go from exactly 10 minutes up to 35 minutes, roughly, especially with the, even with the difficult ones. Now we are adding after that the uh, confirmation either by the radial EBUS, which is be fast. If you get it with there, you're, you start sampling and the sampling time takes between 10 to 15 minutes from each device, but because you want to get confirmation from the rows. But whenever you confirm, your samples will be more biopsies and you finish between. So I tell the patient always the procedure from start till end without or with the staging 60 to 90 minutes for that procedure time. Staff wise, as you see, you need one nurse there, of course, and also you need one tech. Uh, because the nurse will be taking orders, putting that, helping with the sample, and, and the tech too will be there. We have the advantage of in the beginning of the program to have more people in the room because they want to learn. Everybody wants to learn that in case we have that. That's why you saw that room. But you have also floral uh, tech because they come for the fluoroscopy. And you have the rose team uh, from pathology that they come for the procedure. Thanks. And uh, Vishwesh, uh, um, do you have any questions? Yeah, uh, a great lecture, uh, Dr. Abib. Uh, I just got a few queries, like uh, what are all the disposables that we use in this uh, uh, robotic bronchoscopy in each case? Uh, and how cost effective it is? That is uh, the question one. Uh, so the, as you saw, those three pieces I mentioned, the vision probe, the catheter and um, connecting uh, uh, accordion piece. I forgot the precise number of lives, but at least five to seven cases. The only thing that you need to uh, uh, throw after the case is the connecting uh, syringe and that device because it has some secretions, but it can be washed the same way, cleaned the same the, as a bronchoscopy, but always we have maximum seven lives on seven cases for each catheter. The cost is around, I think, around $2,000 per catheter. And what about the TV in a catheter? Like, uh, is it uh, the same what we use in the normal bronchoscopy or? 
No, this is actually uh, provided by um, uh, Intuitive. The reason for that is this, this type of needle, very flexible. You can bend it the whole way. It can go with the, with the, with the, uh, uh, the, the catheter without any, any uh, stuck or uh, being in a position where you are, uh, can't pull it back. That's why it's recommended to be used. And uh, it's not the same as EBUS. It's mainly for, for ion uh, robot. And uh, like, even though we have the perfect guidance by the robotic system, along with that, we have a secondary confirmation with radial EBUS. We still see that we are not able to reach that uh, golden mark of uh, above 95 uh, percent sensitivity. Like what factors do you feel play a role in decreasing the uh, yield uh, despite using a broncos uh, robotic bronchoscopic platform? Any particular uh, things that we should really look for to increase the yield despite having a robotic assistance? Yes. Number one, and I would say this is a very important, the anesthesia, the, the, those setups, settings that I mentioned. The reason I put that paper, uh, it is really the vital, the most vital point that will help you uh, avoiding this mismatch or seeing a signal without getting the answer. The second thing is, if you have, of course, the ideal will be using the cone beam because you are there, you will sample that. There's sometimes that I don't get the answer by one tool. For example, I do the TPNA and intra-op, they will tell me that it's only atypical cells we can't, we don't know. But doing more samples with the forceps uh, improved my uh, final answer. Uh, meaning that instead of doing like five pieces, I make sure that I have 10 to 15 bytes with the forceps mm -hmm. that will give me enough tissue in the in the container that I feel that's another thing that we do. Uh, sometimes we are asking the, the, the anesthesiologist to help us with breath hold, as I mentioned that maneuver, because that you can see the variation of the movement target during the, uh, the procedure. That breath hold can be like for a couple samples, especially if the patient can tolerate it. It helps a lot on improving the yield also. One last uh, question, uh, uh, Dr. A.B. Uh, like, have you ever seen, like, once we take a biopsy, the first pass, uh, is there any artifact that is created by the blood clot which changes your subsequent radial image and which makes it, makes the second pass questionable? Like, uh, any experience on that? Great question. Great question. And I would, I would emphasize about one point before you, uh, about the clot part. I would say also always avoid flushing the working channel with any cell in before you put the radial in, because that can give you, again, the similar similar, uh, similar uh, artifact that you see when you are there. The reason that you see in this case, for example, it's a seven millimeter. We did not do anything before we put the radial in as soon as possible, because that signal is my guidance. If I get it, I'm done. I'm not gonna move from there. I'm going to focus my work to get the answer from there. Um, to your point, some, some tumors, if it's carcinoid or renal cell, they can bleed and they can make your target look better and nicer, but you are not getting, you are getting a lot more than the answer. So with that, I think uh, improving, I avoid TBNA in those cases. I go for biopsies to get more tissue. And I look at the biopsy before we put it on the container to make sure that I see it, uh, a good flesh amount there, as you saw in the pictures too. Yeah, thank you, Abby. Welcome. Eric? Uh... Yeah, um, um, sorry. Uh, but I think uh, Tinku um, raised his hands first. Do you want to go with Tinku first? Yeah. Uh... Tinku is there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. AB, as usual, a fantastic lecture. Uh, uh, I have got a couple of questions. Uh, first and foremost is regarding uh, the cost effectiveness uh, of robotic bronchoscopy, especially in the resource limited settings, like in most of the Asian countries, because mm -hmm. it's a it's a huge uh, uh, cost which we are putting in. 
So a couple of questions regarding uh, the feasibility of robotic bronchoscopy in resource limited setting. Because, I mean, most of these tools, so let it be ready labor, cryo, uh, or uh, robotic stuff, uh, when we compare the cost versus a CT guided FNA or a CT guided biopsy, okay. And uh, whatever said and done, most of these nodules can be sampled with a CT guided uh, biopsy or a CT guided FNA, which is in terms of cost, it is much lesser compared to robotic bronchoscopy. So I feel that until and unless we can use all these technologies for uh, with a curative intent, like rather than purely as a diagnostic modality, if you can utilize this tool for like ablation of cancers, if you can cure cure the cancer with all these most modern technologies, then I feel its cost effectiveness, uh, it, it, it becomes much better. So my question is regarding, apart from diagnostic, purely as a diagnostic tool, can we use robotic bronchoscopy for performing any ablative or a curative treatment? Wonderful question. That, that's that's a great question, uh, thank you. And, and I agree with you that you are comparing uh, 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 the, the technology with just bronchoscopy. I can start from different point here. You, we, we were here doing those navigation bronchoscopy with um, uh, electromagnetic navigation systems that almost have the price of the ion at this point, which is you can gamble now and say to, to the system that I want that, which is a privilege that we have here in the United States compared with the rest of the world, because you are not starting from doing it, as you mentioned, with the bronchoscopy and radio. The second goal from doing that, um, which is very important that you brought up, if we are not reaching with that to the point that we can do ablation and treatment of the airway or the treatment of those lesions, then I agree with you. There is no point of building up, but that's why we started now doing it more wider here because I can see that down the road, we are FDA gonna approve those procedures to be done with endoscopy, bronchoscopy, intervention pulmonary techniques, the same way ended from the surgery doing ablation, the liver lesions versus now I are doing ablations lesions. The, the question that you brought up about doing it with CT guided, I, I agree with you about it, but the cost here for patient to be admitted to the hospital with pneumothorax for three days after CT guided biopsy also outpay the, the, the procedure cost that we have uh, from insurance coverage. That's where we can play a role that we, if we do it this way, we have less chances, 1% versus 20% chance, especially for a seven millimeter that even um, uh, not usually targeted if it's not that much in the central part of the, uh, of the, of the lung. The last part, which is way, why we don't do it with IR versus we do it with, with, the, with the robot. It's very important to remember that we are not targeting, if something, something's sitting on the peripheral of the pleura, we are not gonna go there and, and try to fish around, except if we are doing two targets, usually. That's the only advantage. If we have two lobes that we need to sample at the same procedure, the IR will not be able to do that. So that the time we can do two of them uh, uh, at the same time. But usually we target anything in the inner two thirds of the lung, avoiding using the outer third of the lung. So we are not eliminating IR role at all, but we are targeting smaller lesions with the hope that down the road, we will be able to treat through those smaller lesions with the smaller uh, effect of treatment without causing too much damage. Tinko, I have a point here like, uh... I think we should stop calling uh, ourselves resource limited settings because most companies are not coming forward. Like if you see the COPD market, uh, uh, we still don't have valves here uh, only because the companies don't know like how the market runs here. And um, coming to the middle, uh, as we said, like uh, middle two thirds, definitely a CT graded biopsy, uh, the tissue is not much as good as like if you do a, maybe like in future you can do a small 1.1 cryobiopsy. <clears throat> channels so i hope uh, you agree with me on that except robot in india i think we have everything now in ip 
I, I think also the companies will notice that, I mean, what they pay here, people will not be the same what you pay in India. I, I think they will find the solution for that. Uh, I believe that's what I think. But Kidar, you have a question, right? Yes, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I'm going to step back a little more uh, and ask you a couple of difficult questions. I know you are a big fan of ION and that's really what you have. And my question uh, is going to be a little tricky for you. Uh, I'm sure during the trial part of it, I'm sure you were involved in the initial days. So I'm going to ask you to step back and tell me what is the one feature in the Monarch platform that you really envy and thought that, you know, no, this is something that, you know, ION should have had. So that's my first question. I love the shape sensing technology. It's quite innovative. Uh, it's, it's something that's always intrigued me, but uh, you know, you must always have an appreciation for your rivals. So being an ION guy, what do you think about the Monarch? That's my first question. I, I, my, my answer is you should do what you feel we should use regardless. You should use what you feel you are the most uh, productive with. So my point is, if you feel that you are more productive and useful with the Monarch and you can get higher yield. Nobody, I'm not, I presented today because that's what I'm using. I don't have videos for, for the Monarch. The feature that you mentioned is that you have continuous vision, right? With the, with the Monarch. Uh, I had multiple cases when I reached the near nodule and I can lock on it and I can see it too. All what I need to do is getting out the vision probe and sample in the ion. With the Monarch, you will be able to see and then sample uh, and even apply washes while you are there. All those features are there that not in an ion, for example. The only thing that I was, um, I didn't use it. So I don't wanna make also a, ju a judgment about system because not fair, is that the size of the, the size of the catheter. The extended catheter from the Monarch is like 4.4 millimeter versus 3.5. I don't know if that really a factor that affects reaching to that second, as I said, the inner two thirds of the lung. I think both of them will reach the same thing with the inner two thirds. We're not going that far out to the pleura. So is that something that uh, different? Maybe, but more important for me that I had used before electromagnetic navigation. And I know that there's a big diversion between the electromagnetic navigation systems in general. And the difference in this system is that the catheter itself is the, the, the memor memorizing the electromagnetic. I don't have to put a board under the patient or sideboard or do CAT scan same day, or all, all those things are eliminated. All those, lim and you will not have a perfect system, uh, Kudar, but I think those the reasons that make me think that in a smaller space and, um, as a procedure wise, I don't have to use all of those other parts that will make a, a fluctuation in the diversion part. Um, again, I'll be more honest if I use the other system, but I did not. So maybe they have really, it's fair if you ask somebody used it to have another talk to show you all that for those features too. So the thanks for that. Uh, the second question really is, has there been a situation in the number of cases you've done so far that you had to say, no, I've had to, I'm going to now abandon robotic. I'll go back to the routine bronchoscopy and now sample this. So how many such situations have you had to encounter this? Well, so I have, the reason I'm so, asking you this yeah. is also for the fact that, uh, you know, with the penetration of the, uh, you know, robots in surgery, uh, you know, it's also important that in the worst case scenario, you are competent enough to go back to do your, doing your routine surgical by opening up. So, you know, with the new generation of interventional pulmonologists who may end up getting spoiled with only doing robotic bronchoscopies, uh, how important would this skill be? So how many, how often has this happened in your uh, experience that you had to convert a robotic to a routine bronchoscopy and had to sample? That's my second question. 100% agree with you that you should not jump to a technology before you know the basics. No question about it. You should be an excellent bronchoscopist because that you are the backup in the room. You can't, you can't debate, as you said, that this machine failed, so I am, okay, cancel the procedure. You should have a backup plan. And as you see, when we, I showed the setup of the room, our bronchoscopy always there for, for multiple reasons, because you can't treat emergencies with that, for example. 
how frequent that happened from all what I heard from other people that used it, not never being like reached that level of going in to switch because there's a bleeding or anything like that, except if you're doing really cowboying crazy stuff. I didn't hear about it. But for myself, I did now 30 plus cases. I did not have to do that. Until now, I did not have to do that. The reason also, you should be always be selective. You can't put everybody for a procedure. That's number one. You, you are advocating for the patient, not for number of cases you're doing. And uh, that's maybe one of the keys. Um, the other thing is, if you really get out and got it with the bronchoscopy, you should have started with the bronchoscopy first. <laughs> you should not go with the robot. Uh, makes sense. Am I right? Yes, because yes. it's not it's not fair to put patient for all that setup, anesthesia settings and everything to go that that far. In the beginning, uh, first five cases, maybe you will target something two centimeters and and like three two to three centimeters just for the staff and yourself to get in that cycle. But after that, you are you're good to go, especially if you have the background of because. As much as the machine telling you what to do, whatever you have already in the muscle memory from, from doing those with the radial, it's much become much easier for you to understand because you know that before you rotate a little bit to the right, you thumb down, thumb up, you push the scope in, and then hoops, you got it, right? Uh, that's how, uh, now it is just that more small adjustment with the, uh, with the machine that tell you where you are and you sample. Uh, let me go to the last question and I'll be a little quick. While you were delivering your talk, I was getting reminded of Friends sitcom where Sheldon Cooper was actually trying to choose between Xbox 360 and PS4. So in your free time, after you've done your robotic bronchoscopy, do we usually see AB sitting around playing with his Xbox or PS5? What do Xbox. you usually do? <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. I, I play with my kids. I play with my kids because that's why I play with them. Does that help you with your skills? What games do you recommend us? Actually, actually, the, I, let me tell you, they were beating me bad <laughs> in every game. <laughs> I am, I am. <laughs> but the problem is the eye coordination, uh, uh, hand coordination is really something that you build up. Uh, it's not that much as movement as fast, but I think when you use to high, high speed, uh, movement, you are more easier. Thanks, Abi. That was a wonderful talk, and thank you for taking those difficult questions from my end. Over to you, Hari. Eric, do you have any questions? Right. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, first, uh, Dr. Ab, uh, this is a very, very nice talk. Uh, and again, I just want to say hi and well, thank you for uh, actually asking few question on behalf of me. <laughs> me. I think I have a similar question with Kedar, especially the first question. And thank you for your answer at the AB. So I'm so I'm I just want to follow up on um one of the questions from Kedar. So um do you think um the uh predictors let's say for lesions uh, less than two me uh, millimeters uh, sorry less than uh two cm or less than two cm whether there is a bronchus sign or not whether this is located on an upper lobe as compared to the lower lobe still plays a pivotal role for diagnostic yield using ion or not that would be the first question so uh, upper lobe versus lower lobe upper lobe yield higher for sure okay. number one uh, two, uh, uh, after uh, my 10th cases, I started going up with the uh, uh, lower, num lower size nodules, even yeah. in the missing of uh, the, the target uh, air bronchi uh, the bronchi uh, sign. Bronchi sign, because it has become more for you uh, to know, understand that even you see it in the CAT scan, but you are that far in the lung, yeah. little movement, you can get to that area. Sometimes okay. you make a needle biopsy and then that track, you put the radial, you find the lesion more. It's changing from eccentric to centric. And, mm -hmm. and we see that a lot with that uh, maneuvers because we haven't been that far in the lung uh, from me, myself I'm talking about to reach that level, to have little maneuvers that can be, that be offered to me now compared with the previous technologies. 
All right. Okay. So uh, my, my last questions, um, I think it's quite similar with the question from Tinku. So I'm from Indonesia, I'm from Dr. Cipto Wong Kusumo Hospital, and we are the only hospital in Indonesia that owns a radial probe EBUS. Um, Indonesia is probably the fourth largest population in the world, right. around 170 million. And we are the only hospital who got the equipment. So in terms of cost effectiveness, do you think, let's say, if, you, if, you, if you're if you on my, uh, if you work in be at my hospital, will you recommend to, for, for my hospital to actually purchase this one as compared to what we currently do now, which is we combine radial EBUS uh, with uh, fluoroscopy, uh, and also electromagnetic navigations. So, so that um, so I have a friends also from um, from Middle East, from Emirates, mm -hmm. Saudi, and I was surprised. For example, I'll give you that example because very important to know that their problems there was not the cancer. Their problems there was more ILD, asthma, COPD than this, and I don't know because of the population learning smoking. We're gonna see that down the road on yeah. those populations, like in 20 years. For example, I'm just giving you about that because my friends went to to Cleveland Clinic, Abu Dhabi, and they were telling me we don't see much cancers. That's why uh, that's what how it started. Just I'm bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Depends mm -hmm. on what you're targeting, Eric. What you're targeting. If you're targeting, if you are getting the always delayed delayed signal, meaning you're getting all the nodules two centimeters and above especially as you said, you might be the only radio uh, available hospital. I think that what you have now is enough to have more turnover to get more diagnosis faster. But that's, that's, uh, that goes to the population that you have. Yeah. More than I tell you, you need to get it. You got my point? Yeah. So for example, in, in those uh, countries that I mentioned, uh, they don't have that. That's what I got the message from them that they don't have that much as here, for example, patients who had lung screening program that mm -hmm. they got that CAT scan and we see those nodules between five, three millimeter, five millimeter. Next cat month, they come and become eight or nine millimeter, for example. So that detection is different. So if you are seeing cases that two centimeters and above in 70% or 80% of the population that patient population that you see maybe at this point you are enough with the radio but if you are on the other hand start seeing you want to target more to save more people because they are waiting just to give big cat scan to get bigger then in that case i would say no you have to get it something like that yeah. i hope that answered the question it definitely definitely um well thank you very much uh Davey. thank you thank you everybody yeah, Harry. Uh, do you mind if I have one more question from my end? Please, please. Go so ahead. I, see, I see you're using a Siemens CBCT, right? Right. So like um, we have Philips with us. Uh, like in Philips, we have to add an Imbu guide or uh, a navigation track on suite. How about Siemens? Like do the normal CBCTs that are available in the cap clubs, they need to be upgraded with some softwares or they come integrated with the uh, this thing? That so, is we have an old even as you saw that c-arm is not a new one from siemens and it's connect com compatible with the fluoro that i see it immediately on the screen of the of the robot okay. so i see the radial the, the the radial and the fluoro on the same screen uh so that's one thing the second thing we are upgrading to the uh, uh C cs which is a uh, portable uh comb beam that coming soon and uh, that's what I'd be happy to share with you guys later in the future, what our experience with that too. Yeah. Uh, but what I know is Siemens is, uh, uh, I have friends here using Philips uh, with Ion, with Monarch, everything is compatible. Those are not a, a problem uh, to use any of them. Okay, uh, but the augmented fluoroscopy part, most of the cone beams, they come, we do a spin uh, with our yeah. available machines. But uh, my question is like, do you need a separate software to do the augmented part or um, is it, um, how is it in Siemens? Like I don't have the machine here. Um, we, we don't have to, it's just a spin and then we get the picture and that's it, yeah. And second thing is like uh, uh, when I read like on cone beams, like if you use a metal uh, in between like holding the bronchoscope, uh, mm -hmm. they do have an artifact and they don't recommend uh, using any metal holders there. 
So how about with the robot, when you're doing robot and CBCT, does it cause an artifact? Nothing, zero, zero. That's why it is very, uh, that's why that's the next version of uh, getting accuracy and then moving to the therapeutic part. That's where we are uh, at now. Okay, thank you. I think uh, there, there, there ends the discussion and um, I request Eric to present a small token of appreciation to um, AB for his presentation. Let me share my screen. All right. Um, so, uh, Dr. A.B., on behalf of the uh, organizing committee and, of course, on behalf of um, Dr. Hare Krishnan and team from yesterday, the hospital, uh, we were very, very uh, grateful to have you as yeah. our speaker for today. And we're looking forward for more lecture from you, especially to, to bring the uh, robotic bronchoscopy to Asia. So again, um, on behalf of Yesu, the hospital organizing committee and uh, Dr. Jamal Azizi as the founder of uh, Malaysian Association of Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology. Um, again, thank you very much for your time and for your talk. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. Yes. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed the time with you guys. Looking forward for more. And please feel free to reach out with any time you need. Share the YouTube channel also. That If that helped, uh, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Over to you, Harry. Muted, Harry. <laughs> I think you're still mute, yeah. Um, uh, Harry, you're still on mute, yeah. yeah thank, you. thank you so much for your time and- um, Thank you, Harry. Yes, like maybe we have, um, every fortnight, we have a few lectures on this. Academy of Bronchoscopy and uh, um, let's see some new um, new treatment options coming up. Thank you. Have a nice day, day everybody and thank you for your time and good night for you. It's yes, morning thank here. You. Thank <laughs> you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you for can you thank you for staying late. <laughs> okay.